I study more and more, uh, think about, read about George Washington, you know, the, the, the father of our country, the more I am impressed with him as a man and as a leader. Uh, George Washington was mainly self-educated. His father died when he was 11. And he was able to, uh, he, he at that time inherited some slaves. His views on slavery changed as he aged, but he, he owned slaves because he was, uh, he inherited them from his father. But he was mainly self-educated in that he uh, didn't go to formal schooling. He actually just learned and read and read and wrote and interacted with people, not just on this continent, but uh, across the sea. As he continued to grow and took place, he became a leader in war, obviously the Revolutionary War, and in governance after the Revolutionary War. He was the first to sign the US Constitution. He wanted to make sure that he was the one who was first in line for that. He was unanimously elected president twice. Can you imagine that today? Someone being unanimously elected president, even by the electors. But he was elected by the electors in the first 10 states, during his first presidency, and then uh, by the 13 in the next. Those who were, all who were eligible voted for him as president. And yet after two terms, George Washington stepped away from power. He stepped down as president, signifying that the American experiment would no longer be a monarchy or a life term, but rather it would be led by different people from different stations in life. And upon his death, he made sure that his slaves, those he had inherited from his father, were set free so that they could be taken care of by his foundation, by his, uh, by his uh, wealth after he died. But what made George Washington such a great leader? Lots of this has been written on it, but I think many things come down to that he was a man of great faith. And that as he interacted with the Bible, as he interacted with his faith, he carried those convictions into all of his relationships, his interactions with other people. He treated those around him with dignity and respect. He had high expectations for the people around him, and yet he trusted them to do what he asked them to do. He was fearless in battle, fearless going forward. He had, in one battle, he had two horses shot out from under him and four bullet holes in his coat, and yet he pressed the charge. George Washington placed his people's welfare above his own ambitions. And when the time came where he could choose to hold on to and to grip power, he chose to hold it with an open hand. God's blessing on George Washington's life, I think, was rooted in his faith in God. But you know, for us, good leaders are a blessing to people. And poor leaders bring trouble. Proverbs 29, 2 says, When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. The Bible says of David in Psalm 78, that David, with upright heart, he shepherded the people and he guided them with his skillful hand. Good leaders produce good times. Poor ones bring trouble. And especially in times of trouble, good, good leadership is even more important. In the home, in the community, in our nation, and in the church. Good leadership can lead pathways to light and life rather than darkness and oppression. I would invite you to take your copy of the scriptures and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5 as we continue to study this letter. We're now at the last chapter of this letter. Peter has been writing to elect exiles, those who are born again in Christ, who, have, who live in Asia Minor. He's been writing to them in the last part of this letter about living in the midst of suffering. Today he's going to specifically address a group of people, but actually at the end address all of us. So please follow along as I read from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, 
as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This is the word of the Lord, and every word of God proves true. I think Peter is helping us to see that humility should be the pattern of life for all believers, especially leaders. As we open up the text this morning, would you join me in the word of prayer? Father God, would you open up our eyes by your spirit to see what you have written from Peter to the exiles, and that we can learn in our lives and apply to our lives. Would you help us to see what you would have us see? Would you transform our hearts so that we would understand and that we would believe what your word says? And that would you help us to walk in a new way because we have spent time with you and your spirit and your word. Teach us now, we ask, in Jesus' name. Well, as you can tell, this passage is primarily directed towards elders. If you are not an elder, this is not a good time to check out. Um, let me tell you why. I'll give you a, a personal story. Uh, I was doing some elder training with, uh, with a friend back at a, a previous church, and we began the training together. And after about three weeks of training, he said, you know, I don't, I don't think I want to be an elder. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I didn't know if I was failing in my training, if I, you know, what was going on. And he said, he said, I want to continue the training though, because what I've seen in it has helped me to be a better dad. It's helped me to be a better husband. As I'm learning what an elder does, I'm learning that I've got some maturing to do, and I want to apply that. And so I want to continue the elder training so that I can be a better husband, a better dad, a better person um, in in my community. And uh, and so I said, oh, great, that, that's fine. I said, someday, you know, we recognize that you have some qualities of being an elder. Someday, though, I hope that you're open to being an elder. Well, fast forward about five years, uh, we had gone back to, uh, to a graduation party, and he came over and sat next to me. We began talking, and he goes, hey, you're never going to believe this. He said, you know how we went through that, that elder training, and I told you I didn't want to be an elder? Not for a while. Says I, I'm actually now the elder chair at our church. I, I say that because I don't want you to check out when we're talking about elders this morning. Maybe God has called you to an eldership. Maybe God has called you to leadership in your home. There are things that we can learn about how to be good, godly people that aren't necessarily just tied to eldership this morning. We're all going to talk about that, but please. Uh, pay attention, and so we are growing together and maturing in that. Well, the first thing I think we see in, in, in this passage is that elders have a God-given role to fulfill. Elders have a God-given role to fulfill. God's designed the church to fulfill a specific purpose in life, and that is to display the gospel. God takes those who are separated from him and separated from each other and brings them together in Christ. That's, that's a picture of the gospel. God then helps them to grow together to maturity in Christ through the Holy Spirit. And God displays then his mercy and grace to the rest of the world as his people come together, grow together, and show who he is to everyone around them. And in that purpose, Jesus gives gifts to the church. He gives specific gifts to play a part in maturing the church. To accomplish his purposes and his goals for his people and to display his grace. In Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12, it says this, He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherd teachers. Those last terms, shepherds, teachers, sometimes are combined, sometimes are pushed together. The shepherds and teachers are spoken of in other places, including our text, sometimes referred to as elders, sometimes bishops or overseers or shepherds. But they all describe those who are to shepherd the flock of God locally, 
And that's kind of what Peter says in verses 1 and 2 here. This is his exhortation to the elders. So exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. Peter uses shepherding language here. He says, shepherd the flock that is among you. Those who are in leadership, those who are guiding the group of people locally, the people that they are among, are like a shepherd guiding sheep to help them to move together, to grow together in maturity, to be safe. Why has God given elders to the church? Let's look back at that passage again. He gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. For the building up of the body of Christ. The purpose of the shepherd teachers, the purpose of elders is to equip the saints for ministry. God's design for his church is the equipping of the saints. His design is for individual believers. That is, he has given you specific gifts. Each of the believers in the church has at least a spiritual gift. Some have combinations of spiritual gifts. And the goal of those spiritual gifts and the goal of Equipping the saints for the work of ministry is that individuals would be stepping into ministry, pursuing ministry in their own spheres of influence, the places where God has put you. God has plans for you. He has a role for you in the body of Christ. He has put you right where he wants you, and he has gifted you in that. He uniquely puts you there. And the goal of the elders, the job of the elders, is to help you to accomplish what God has planned for you individually. And God has a plan for the church as a whole to coordinate together, to train the whole body in godliness as part of the role of the elders. To guard against false teaching, strife, and division. To care for the body when the body is hurting. To help the body love each other. And then to lead the, the church an impact in its community and world. Elders are to be mature believers who help in basically these four areas. To protect, that is to guard against outside and inside harm. To feed, that is to teach and instruct in the word of God and right living. To lead, to provide direction and oversight to the flock. And to care. To lovingly coordinate help for the hurting sheep. To protect, to feed, to lead, and to care. As elders do that together, it accomplishes something within the body of Christ. So let's go back to Ephesians and see what, what Paul says is the reason why. In verses 13 to 16, he writes this. Until we attain to all the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by, the, by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. In other words, so that we may mature so that we don't keep getting moved side by side by the latest thing that comes, but rather we stand firm together on the word of God, on the ways of God, in the love of God. And then he goes on in verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. God gives people, people to the church as elders and gifts to the church to help us all together grow up into Christ. As each person is doing their own part, the whole body grows together and builds itself up in love. To desire to be an elder is a good thing. 1 Timothy 3 1 says this, this is a trustworthy thing. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. There are qualifications for elders laid out in Titus 1. In uh, 1 Timothy 3, these qualities, uh, these, are, these are qualifications, these are a minimum standard. If you look at those qualities of an elder, the 
qualifications, you will see that it is the picture of a growing Christian who is able to then teach and lead and help others. The qualities and attitude of what, how the elders play that out, how they, how they live that in front of the congregation is what our passage here today is going to talk about. We'll go into that a little bit shortly. Well, Peter identifies himself as a fellow elder. This should be giving encouragement to the elders in Asia, the elders at local churches even now. This is legitimacy for the role of an elder. It should also be encouraging to the flock of God that Peter acknowledges and he, he says, I am also an elder, just like your elders. Notice the context that Peter places on his eldership. He says he's a fellow elder. He's a, also a witness to the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker of the glory that's to be revealed. He hasn't moved from what he's been telling us through the whole letter. But suffering for Christ leads to glory. Peter's saying, I've seen the sufferings of Christ. I witnessed Christ's sufferings. He also says, I witnessed the glory of Christ. Now, we would naturally think the sufferings of Christ lead to the glory of Christ. That's the, talking about the resurrection. But I think he's actually talking about the transfiguration. That Jesus was transfigured. He was transformed from his regular, what people he normally saw, to his glorified state as he talked with Moses and Elijah. Peter has partaken as an elder. He has seen both the sufferings of Christ and he has seen what is to come. That's an encouragement for a believer who's going through suffering in the name of Christ. There is good to come. Greater things are on the way. This is hope-filled encouragement for believers. And Peter also notes that though he is an apostle, he is also an under-shepherd. Take a look at verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Peter knows there's a chief shepherd. And that chief shepherd is going to come. The chief shepherd is the true leader of the people. Other shepherds, under shepherds, elders, have been apportioned a flock. Verse 3 says, the flock that is in your charge. All under shepherds are responsible to and give an account to Jesus. Some to glory and reward, as he mentions here, the unfading crown of glory. Others discipline and loss because they don't carry out the duties of the under shepherd. So all elders should be humble and helpful to God's flock so that we can grow in faith together. Humility should be the pattern of life for all believers, especially elders. Elders are also, number two, or elders are to shepherd by example in humility. Elders are to shepherd by example in humility. Peter gives some guidelines to the elders who are leading their people in times of suffering and persecution. Verses 2 to 4 say this, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. As elders shepherd the flock, they should have the right attitude. They should have the right purpose, and they should walk in these ways. So let's look at what Peter tells us, the list of things the elders should do and should not do. First off, elders should shepherd, shepherd the flock. Note that he says that the flock that is among you. Elders are to oversee their own flock. They are not to be in charge of everyone else's flock. There's not a, a national flock and the overseers. They are to be among the flock that they are leading. Someone has said that this is a, a phrase like shepherds should smell like sheep. Yeah. If you've ever been around livestock, if you've ever worked with livestock, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, my son Jake did uh, some power washing at pig barns uh, as he was finishing up high school to earn some money. And we made sure when he came inside that he took off all of his pig clothes, that they went right into the laundry, and that he showered well. We bought him some special soap. Because if he missed just a little bit in his ear, 
or a little bit in his hair, he would smell like what he was spraying off the walls in the pig barn. He would smell like manure all the time. Shepherds smell like sheep because they're amongst them, because they're spending time with them. For example, our elders here interact with you on Sunday mornings. They interact with you throughout the week. They are among you and they smell like you. You should notice that they have spent time with you, that they've invested you, that they've greeted you, that they've asked how you're doing. Our elders do a good job of smelling like sheep. The second thing that the elders are to do is to exercise oversight. They're to be active in their work to protect, feed, lead, and care. They're to be aware of things that are going on in people's lives, both in the life of the church and in individual lives. And that exercising oversight does not come from a power position. It comes from a position of love, a love for God and a love for the people of God. And so as elders exercise oversight, we have to understand that sometimes that's a hard thing to do. Sometimes it means making unpopular decisions. Sometimes it means confronting sin and strife. It means caring for the sick or the dying. Sometimes it can cause people to not like you. But it always involves hours of prayer and studying the word and growing themselves so they're equipped to lead you well. Work of an elder is often unappreciated by those involved. I would like for our elders at this time, if you would, four gentlemen, please stand. I would like for us to, in a small way, appreciate them now with a round of applause for the work they do. Would you continue your thanks to them by continuing to pray for them, pray for their families, pray for their ventures outside of the church body, pray for their spiritual lives to continue to fill up so they are leading out of the overflow of what God is doing in them. Thank them for investments that they've made in your life. Don't wait for a celebration of life service to do that. Do that regularly. Encourage Pray for them. Let them know you're praying for them. As they exercise oversight, it's not always an easy job. But when it's appreciated, it makes it a little bit more palatable, a little more easy. Elders are also to shepherd willingly, not under compulsion. Peter warns the elders not to be lazy or forced to do what they're doing. Well, there's an opening, so somebody's got to do it. I guess I've got to do it. Or, well, my wife wants me to, or my friend wants me to be an elder, so I guess I'm going to do it. Or, compulsion can also mean that they are not doing what they're supposed to do. And they're constantly being told, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. Elders are to lead willingly, not under compulsion. Again, it's the result of love for God and love for the flock. With compulsion, the heart is not in it. Leaders should not lead out of fear or guilt or to please other people, but to please the Lord. And an elder who is seeking to please the Lord is in the best place to serve those that he is overseeing. Shepherds, or elders should shepherd eagerly and not for shameful gain. Greed has no place in the shepherding of God's people. Greed leads to injustice or preferential treatment. It corrupts the intentions of of overseeing, of caring for all the people, and it divides allegiance between selfishness and action. Rather, the motivation for the elder in loving God, in loving the people, is to serve eagerly. I want to do this. I want to do this because I am compelled by this. Because I love this people. God has placed me in this role. I'm not doing it for monetary gain, for selfishness, for pride, for the picture of power, but rather I'm doing it with eagerness because I love the body and I love Jesus. 
Finally, an elder is to be an example, not domineering over the flock. Many fear the idea of eldership or elder leadership because of abuses in the past of past leaders, not even inside the church, but sometimes inside the church. Lord Acton famously said, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Our sinful hearts will take authority and run with it. With that authority unchecked, it will turn corrupt. Jesus, when he was talking to his disciples, they were having a disagreement about who was going to be the greatest among them. And Jesus says this to them in Luke 22, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you be as the youngest, and the leader as the one who serves. But I am among you as the one who serves. Rather than taking a picture of the kingdom where you have a top-down leadership, the picture of the kingdom that Jesus paints for his disciples is of a bottom-up leadership. The leadership of the elders, the leadership of the, the leadership in the church is to help the church to accomplish what God has for them, with Christ being the head over all, all growing together. This is why it's important to have a plurality of elders, to have more than one elder. We, when we look in the Bible, we don't see a one-person leadership. It is not a pastor and then everybody else. Rather, we have a plurality of elders. I enjoy leading together with these men who just stood. I enjoy hearing from them, learning from them, gaining wisdom, being checked myself. There's an accountability that comes in that as we walk with each other. It helps us to not be domineering, but rather to be an example. So elder oversight is a better term than elder rule, what some people call it. The elders start to be among the sheep, interacting with them, but also as a guide and a model by which they see faith in action among them. This takes patience and wisdom, and it's showing the flock that it's showing the flock how to do things, not just telling them what to do. I'm thankful for our elders as they do that, as they live that out. Once again, Peter gives the elders a picture of what is to be gained by faithfully carrying out their role, the unfading crown of glory. In Peter's time, the crowns were given to conquering heroes, those who captured uh, other battles, captured battles, captured other lands in war, or they were given to the victors of a race that was won, a, a knotted together uh, branch or vine with leaves on it, which after a while would fade, would dry up, would crumble. But this unfading crown of glory is given by the chief shepherd to the humble, humble elder who fulfills their duty. It will not fade. It will not dry. It will not crumble. It's the reward of the good and faithful servant. And it has been won, not by the elder, but by Jesus himself in his victory on the cross. Elders are to lead the flock humbly, shepherding and exercising oversight as a model for the church so that we all grow together in faith. And then Peter encourages the rest of us. He encourages the interactions with the elders also by the church because humility should be a pattern of life for all believers, especially those in leadership. And so humility and honor are to be evident in all. That's our last place we're going to stop in verse 5 today. Humility and honor are to be evident in all. The whole church is to resemble the humility that leads to unity. Verse 5 says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He starts by saying that the attitude of those who are younger, younger in the faith, should look to the example that is put before them by elders. What is the example that is put before them by elders? Because he says, likewise. In other words, look at your elders and then live like they do. What is the example that they have? Well, elders are subject to the chief shepherd. And therefore, the church should subject themselves to the elder oversight the same way that the elders submit themselves to the chief shepherd, to the, to the task that God has given to them. It should be of mutual benefit to the elders and to the flock as they 
grow up together, as we mature together. As the elders submit to the Lord, lead the flock, they lead the flock toward the good things of the Lord. They display and exercise loving oversight. They protect, feed, lead, and care. And the flock in return responds with submission to the elders' good work. They make it easier to lead. They communicate trust and honor. And it lessens opportunities for dissension and conflict. So how is this supposed to look? What is the key to this? It is humility. It's humility. Peter calls on all church elders and the rest to clothe themselves with humility towards each other. Humility fights one of our common, most str uh, strongest sinful desires, and that is pride. We all struggle with pride. In fact, we've got a month coming up, noted in about a couple weeks, Pride Month, where I'm sure that the, the whole reason for it is to think about our own pride, to put that to death, to put that off, Maybe not, but I like to think of it as Pride Month because I struggle with pride every month. And Pride Month, I understand the depth, the depth of the, the problems that, that pride causes. Pride tears at the fabric of the church. He's already addressed this in the domineering and the greed that he warned the elders about above. But pride wrecks people. It wrecks relationships. Humility is... Therefore, the counter to that. When pride wrecks people and wrecks relationship, we have reason to understand why God opposes the proud. It produces brokenness and selfishness in his family, in his body. It attempts to put us in his rightful place. God opposes, stands against the proud. And gives grace to the humble. Humility is submission first to God. We submit to him as our king, as our chief shepherd. We submit to his ways in how we live our life. And then we clothe ourselves with humility towards each other. We look to put the other person first. We understand that, that none of us is going to see the whole picture as God does. And so we lean on each other. We learn from each other's wisdom. We clothe ourselves with humility, coming in, asking questions rather than making statements. As we walk with each other in humility, we see the value of the other person, not just in their own being made in the image of God, but their value to us. As we humbly recognize we don't see the whole picture. We tear down walls in humility. We open up our arms and seek reconciliation. And we display the value of every person in the body of Christ. So in leadership or in following, true humility is recognizing who you are in Christ. It's recognizing yourself as a creature under God's sovereign hand. It's recognizing yourself as a sinner saved by grace, but now a child of God. It's not simply saying, humility isn't simply saying, well, I don't really matter. I, I, I'm nobody. Humility is recognizing who you actually are. That you are a child of the King. That you are a co-heir with Christ. That you are, in, in the case of an elder, a fellow elder with Peter. In the case of not being an elder, that you are sharing in Christ's sufferings so that you can receive that you can see fully the glory that is to be revealed. That is true of you. Humility is not discounting that, but rather seeing it in its right light. If God has put you in leadership in your home or in the church body, recognize yourself as that. As an elder given by the God to help the church grow and mature, <clears throat> recognize that, but walk humbly, clothe yourself with humility towards each other. Humility shows us who we are and who God is and how we're to walk, and that's why it should be the pattern of life for all believers. When we look at leadership in the church today, it's important to know that good leaders in our nation, state, and community are helpful, but especially in our local church because it is the picture for our community of what God's people are like <coughs> to represent Jesus to the world. So what are we going to do going from this place today? Well, if you are an elder, 
shepherd the flock that is among you. Love them, lead them, protect them, feed them, care for them. Exercise oversight under the chief shepherd. If you are a potential elder, if you have thought about this, maybe someone has mentioned something to you, maybe you have been contemplating it, wrestling it over in your mind, maybe someday, maybe I, I should consider being a leader. If you, an elder, do you know what Peter's, or what Paul says? The desire to be an elder is desire a noble task. We would love to, to hear from you if that's something that God has laid on your heart. Know that it is a good thing. If you are a leader in your home, lead your family well. Draw them to the Lord. Lead with humility, recognizing and accepting the place that God has placed you. And then exercising oversight in your home well. <coughs> Love your family well. <coughs> Care for them. Lead, feed, protect. And for all of us, to show humility to one another. Clothing ourselves in humility. Leaning on each other for help and wisdom and patiently bearing with each other in love. When we do this, we are going to be a picture for those in the church, those outside the church, of what a redeemed people are. We're going to be displaying the gospel under our chief shepherd for the glory of God and for the good of his people. Now, you may not be a George Washington. You may not be recognized as an outstanding political, military, or civic leader, but you can humbly lead in your home, in your workplace, your school, in the community, and in our church, so that those who are yet to come will remember, as we did yesterday, Al's life. We will remember someone who walked their talk. They were a good and faithful servant. And you may be the foundation for a whole new generation of believers because of the way that you walk humbly in leadership. I invite you to join me as we close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it instructs us in many ways of life. And I thank you for the words we've heard this morning. Would you help us, first of all, to recognize you as our king, as our chief shepherd? Would you help us to humiliate, or to, to be humble, to be humiliated before you, recognizing that you are worthy of all glory and all praise, and compared to you, our love for this world, our love for the things of this life, our love for our, our own desires, should be utterly humble. And yet, Lord, we thank you that you have chosen to put your grace on us, that you have chosen to make us your people, to raise up certain of us into leadership. And we ask, Lord, that we would be constantly thinking of the place that you have for us, that we are all together doing our part growing up into the head, which is Christ. I thank you for our elders. And Lord, I thank you for them being men of God, being men who are not just lip service, but actual service. Serving our congregation, loving them, caring for them, providing for needs. I thank you that they love you and that it is evident in their lives. And I ask, Father, that you would bless them, bless their families, bless their endeavors outside of our church family because of their willingness to humbly lead. And in doing so, Father, we give thanks to you together for them. Thank you for Jesus, who secured our glory through his suffering. Would you help us to walk with him more and more each day this week? Thank you for loving us 